Working. Yeah, yes, that's working. Are we all set? Yes. Are we all set? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we had a remarkable uh, day of study, Shalini did you, on Sarah Hoffman today. And uh, it will be, it, it was recorded, and so it will be placed on the website in, in a while. But we thought that we would kind of recap some of the highlights uh, of the day. And, uh, and talk a little bit about what we what we learned and uh, and where we got uh, with this day of study on Sarah Kaufman. Sarah Kaufman, of course, the French philosopher, was deeply marked um, by her encounter with Nietzsche uh, and with Freud. Uh, she was a professor at the University of Paris, and she published numerous books on Nietzsche. Um, uh, starting with Nietzsche et la Métaphore, Nietzsche and Metaphor, which was translated into English, uh, that was published in 1972. Um, Nietzsche et la scène uh, philosophique in 79. Uh, two books, Explosion 1 and Explosion 2. Explosion 1 was the Métier Homo de Nietzsche, which was 92. And then Les Enfants de Nietzsche, Explosion uh, 2 from 1993. And then in 1994, the last book, Le Mépris des Juifs, mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche, des Juifs, l'Antisémite. And um, in addition to those, some really important works of hers were autobiographical works where she spoke about her, uh, her experience, her, her harrowing experience as a, as a Jewish young girl uh, during the French occupation. Uh, so, um, and, um, and her take and her engagement with Nietzsche was particularly interesting because of the way that it actually transformed her and transformed her into the philosopher that she was uh, and that uh, she became as a result of uh, reading so closely uh, the work of Nietzsche. So we had uh, a morning panel with uh, Daniel Cohen-Devinas, Geneviève Fraisse, and Mara Montanaro. Uh, and their engagements were particularly uh, interesting. There's one line actually from Daniel Cohen Medinas that I was really struck by. Um, and it was uh, this uh, line that Daniel Rodrigue de Nietzsche, il y a un Behind the laughter of Nietzsche, uh, there was an abyss. Um, an abyss. Um, and, uh, and the other interventions uh, were also particularly interesting. Uh, Geneviève Fraisse, who was addressing the question of the woman in, um, in Nietzsche's work, I think gave a really interesting intervention where she showed the, the way in which you know, um, uh, Sarah Kaufman herself in the, on the issue of uh, Nietzsche and women uh, didn't so much resolve it at a philosophical level textually, but actually lived or, or kind of was an embodiment of a resolution um, of the woman problem uh, in Nietzsche. But actually, let me, let me, um, let me invite Warren and Daniele to kind of, uh, you know, um, go over this and talk about it some. Um, I'm not sure how, how we, we didn't, we didn't really plan this out yet. Uh, so we could either go through some of the interventions that were made or kind of uh, kick off from uh, things that were particularly interesting. Warren, do you have an idea? Um, I actually wanted to start with Okay. Yes. I thought that you did a lovely job framing framing the day and and kind of I mean both politically I mean I also you're bringing it to this political moments but also talking about you know the book becomes human that's what you were talking about but then I was talking about reading as as a political exercise and um, and also um, a spiritual exercise um, really the question of embodying the reading and how the reading, I think for me, as an internal process, is something that is something we are incorporating as we read these words that get transformed into, 
businesses and into you know, kind of impulses and, and how powerful that is and something that we tend to not think about so much. And that was a theme that carried through through the day with me, um, what the body can and cannot incorporate. And living in a period where I'm having trouble stomaching a lot of things. <laughs> It, it got me thinking about, um, and uh, Monique Schneider's piece, uh, her presentation, I thought, she did it, it was an interesting counterbalance to what the Jean-Pierre Press was talking about, and what um, Daniela Cohen-Williams was talking about, in terms of, of woman and mise en cas, the stomach, how do we think about this internal space, if we think about it for women often in terms of motherhood, in terms of accepting a baby, incorporating a new person, bringing that person into the world, but also the body as something that says yes or no to us, it has to, um, to um, incorporate. And in, we didn't speak a lot about it, although Diana Bouvinas um, did, uh, she mentioned a real Bouvinas de la where this precise question of the, the, the body of the infant and the child. How the, how the child can take in or take meaning to um, to throw up <laughs> actually you know what can be internalized and what cannot and has to be rejected and so I thought it was, it was interesting when we were talking about the stomach that we didn't sort of spend more time talking about that dialogue within growing up with that that power is precisely about this change from a um, cache from a <laughs> to the impacted side and what what it means to incorporate things. Mm -hmm. So I mean that was along those lines. Mm -hmm. sort of yeah. 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 I mean it's uh, yeah and thanks for bringing this back to Daniela's original introduction because um there was something in the introduction that I, I also really appreciated which had to do with this idea of it, it actually goes to the larger question of Nietzsche 1313, um, which is not only to uh, interrogate, but then to reactivate. Mm, in some way. Like that, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah uh, that we see it through Nietzsche. But I also like the way that you have these different categories of ways in which we can, um, or the ways in which these critical thinkers have engaged um, the thought of Nietzsche. And you, 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 you describe some of this group by group. Um, you know, fellow travelers, mm -hmm. um, and you had other categories, and, and then some as a mass, mm -hmm. right, or like a double, mm -hmm. um, which I think is entirely right. I mean, I think we saw that pretty much with maybe, maybe with Blanchot or, or pieces mm -hmm. of the time, um, explicitly at times, right? You are my double, I am you, mm -hmm. you are me, or something like that, as a way to then kind of. Um, to, uh, to do something about one's own work and about one's own identity. Um, then in Cornelius Nass spoke, that, spoke about the fact that for Kaufman, Nietzsche was a figure d'identification. Mm -hmm. um, and of course that's also, that's also a different way to engage the text and the work and author, right, as a figure of identification. Uh, she spoke of it in terms of a dramatic duo in some way. Which was interesting, particularly because in her work, when you, when you, when you read it, you slip in and out of Nietzsche's writings so seamlessly that as Daniel Cohen was suggesting at times, you don't know who is speaking anymore. Um, which, of course, allows for two things. I mean, you don't know who's speaking anymore, but Clearly, it's Kaufman's text, mm -hmm. right? And so, in a way, it's not Kaufman who disappears, it's almost Nietzsche who disappears um, in the text, uh, allowing for her to then kind of uh, develop critically uh, the way that um, she wants. Then, you were going to say something? Yeah, um, well, I just want to. Um, maybe uh, do a little follow up to this question because one of, one of the questions that um, came up at the end of our day, um, both in Mathieu's project and your Unlearn uh, presentations, was the question of how 
the more ads you see there, the more reach. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean to be to be too faithful? Faithful, yeah. faithful uh, to niche when we are reading niche and when we are writing on niche, and and, and this has has something to do, I think, with 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 the question of, of the different attitudes we can have, you know, um, uh, compagnon de route, uh, a double mask, you know, a figure of the identification. Um, and, and what is interesting, I think, in, in Sarah Kaufman's uh, way of, of, of framing this, this question of, of how to be faithful to Nietzsche is that um, she actually tries to uh, read Nietzsche as Nietzsche would have read himself, you know, if, if, if it was the text of an father. I mean, it, 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 this, this insistence on the theological way of reading the text uh, is something that I think we don't exactly have like that in, in, in Rancho or or on many other critical thinkers who have, who have studied so far. Um, and, and of course, this implies, you know, a double um, a sort of a, a trick because at, at the same time, um, Sarah Kaufman uh, seems to be doing nothing more than a counter on you know, Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, we, we, we really uh, uh, feel that what she's doing is not only a commentary, it's, it's, she, she's trying to take Nietzsche seriously, what, according to her, nobody, or maybe really nobody at the time, uh, in, in the 70s, was doing at least in France. Uh, so, this, this is something, and, and this is the difference uh, from, uh, well, of, of, of Sarah Gaffman's interpretation of Nietzsche from, uh, for example, the Leuze interpretation of Nietzsche, or, for example, Matai, or Blanchot's interpretation of, of Nietzsche. And, 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 and this is a point on, on which uh, I think uh, it's very important to, you know, to insist. And, and it was part of, of what I meant by, you know, uh, autonomy and the political importance of, of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, according to Kaufman, we do justice mm -hmm. to Nietzsche if we try to read Nietzsche this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so that raises an interesting question, I think, about the relationship between Kaufman's work and other philosophers who she is thinking with and working with, um, particularly Derrida, I think. Um, and there was one interesting comment during the morning, I think, uh, which uh, I forget, I, think I, I forget who, um, which, who made it, but it had to do with, um, I think it was Daniel Nass or something, I think so, um, that uh, she was not doing deconstruction, uh, I think the claim was. And I think actually that, I think that she may well have been doing deconstruction, at least in uh, Nietzsche and in metaphor. Um, and that it may in fact have been kind of instructive to others uh, who were thinking. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of delve a little bit into the book, uh, Nietzsche and Metaphor, which um, we discussed a lot today, but um, just to, to get at the heart of it, which um, the way I read it, the Kaufman, I mean, the, the first cut is that what Kaufman is trying to do at first, at least, is to show that Nietzsche was flipping the relationship between metaphor and consonant. Um, so the traditional dominant philosophical reliance on concepts, and, and that's something that it seems as if, at least very much so in the early work of Nietzsche, 
And he's trying to flip that, right? And the birth of tragedy is all about being out of the, the role of not only music, but poetry and metaphor in a kind of way. Now, and I think that what, what makes her move, I think, deconstructive is that she doesn't stick with a reversal of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And there are passages in which which, which which suggest that what he was trying to do was to flip the hierarchy so that metaphor is more important. And, and there are passages where it, that's mm -hmm. pretty clear. But, but instead of leaving it there, what she shows is that kind of he explodes the, the distinction mm -hmm. such that at the end, um, there is no longer an important distinction between conceptual and metaphorical analysis from a philosophical point of view, such that his philosophical intervention becomes one that kind of old, that gets beyond uh, the metaphor versus the concept. Now, and she, and, and she writes, and so she writes in uh, Nietzsche metaphor, right, that, um, uh, of course, the conceptual is itself a metaphor, which she tells us. As she writes on page 86, every concept is a synthesis of undialectizable meanings. Okay, so it's pretty clear that the way that she gets at that distinction is to show that one is actually made of the other, right? Concepts are built out of uh, you know, petrified metaphors that we've forgotten, right? But the important point is that where that leaves us at the end of the day um, is not simply with a reversal of the conventional hierarchy um, that would privilege logos or reason over metaphor and poetry, um, which itself would just be another kind of hierarchy. The point instead is to show that the two terms are implicated, function together. They function together differently than we would suppose that they would on a simple reversal. Mm -hmm. um, and that the conceptual, which turns out to be metaphorical, um, uh, becomes blended with a metaphorical or poetic that ends up being rigorous philosophy. Right? And so he is able to turn metaphor and concept into philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, she has this passage uh, on page 17 of, uh, of the book uh, where she writes, um, by bestowing highly precise limits on the metaphorical, Nietzsche was able to hide the fact that, concept, that the conceptual is itself metaphorical. Right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so Nietzsche himself hides the fact that conceptual is itself metaphorical, right? And she writes, by facing the opposition of kind between metaphor and concept and substituting merely a difference of degree with metaphor being the less metaphorical, Nietzsche inaugurates a type of philosophy which deliberately uses metaphors at the risk of being confused with poetry. Mm -hmm. right? And at the end of that, I take it, uh, what we have is Nietzsche as philosopher, um, no longer really needing to depend on the distinction, mm -hmm. using multiple metaphors and concepts, um, getting past, in other words, that distinction, getting past the hierarchy itself. That seems to be um, an early uh, and, and constructive, a deconstructive practice that um, I think would have been very formative for other folks at the time um, thinking about these questions. Um, so, it, 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 yeah, it seems that the book itself would have had a strong impact on her surroundings, uh, Derek Young and others, um, who would have been um, kind of thinking in a somewhat similar vein. Yeah, I think that goes back to the question of reactivation rubbing the coins so that you can see them in the sand. I mean, it's kind of right. re-enlightening the world in a way that's quiet. And I think what Abigail was talking about, explosion, and how one might, I mean, it's not true in this case, but how you would be expecting an explosion if there isn't some sort of dynamic.
animal that you're describing, but in fact, it would have to be a very quiet and dissolution of the eye as she causes you to sort of just toss. And, it's, um, and but through that kind of meandering and wandering, that this is reactivation. There's this way that her kind of thought touches something that reactivates it and she sheds light on it in a way that I don't think is usually the case. Right. Absolutely agree right. that that right. is uh, right. Right. I actually love. I actually love that metaphor um, of uh, kind of shining the coin. Right. <laughs> well, that's because Nietzsche, because Nietzsche, right. Right. Because Nietzsche, Nietzsche's metaphor is that it gets worn off. Exactly. Right. Where you're right. taking the right. coin and right. trying right. to use it. Right. Which is the ultimate example of the ultimate illustration right. of how a metaphor becomes a concept. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And what, what is interesting is that um, I, I have the impression that Sarah Alton is very attentive, uh, is very um, um, to the spatial dimension of, of thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in Nietzsche, in Amitator, uh, she, she explains how in Birth of, 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 of Tragedy, uh, there's kind of a strategic use by of the notion of metaphor itself, and then the, the later works, uh, you know, when, when Nietzsche comes to uh, um, starts to use uh, the concept of interpretation, uh, you know, just the concept of metaphor itself, and the whole opposition between the conceptual and the metaphorical you know, just uh, explodes. It's, it's, it's no longer um, it's no longer useful, but at the same time. In some way, what Nietzsche did in the birth of, of tragedy, even if it was not, you know, the the, um, uh, the last uh, his last word was was strategically necessary mm-hmm. in order to, you know, deconstruct uh, this very opposition between the metaphorical and the conceptual, and 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 it's exactly the same. Uh, Way of framing uh, another problem that, that has come up uh, in some of the interventions today, which is the, the problem of um, the relation between uh, the masculine and the feminine. Uh, uh, and well, according to Sarah Kaufman, we have seen that uh, this is an metaphysical opposition that has to be deconstructed, and that the problem is not uh, only. The problem of the divinia thumbnail philosophy, since the divinia thumbnail philosophy itself is not enough, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it is a, st- a strategic um, step that we have to take if you want precisely to uh, to get this opposition uh, deconstructed. So uh, there's there's an, a, a very subtle way that Kant has to be attentive to. Uh, the strategic way, and, and, and I think that this is really a niche and part of the thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, when thinking has to do with conflict, thinking has to do with strategy, thinking has to do with you know uh, uh, all these political terms mm-hmm. that we uh, uh, that 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 is so hard for us to use when we come to thinking and to philosophy. Because we imagine that philosophy has nothing to do with that, it just has to do with the purity of, of the concept. And, and, and I think that this is something that Nietzsche uh, uh, teaches us that it's, you know, it's, it's not at all like that. And, and, and this is something that Kaufman really takes seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's sort of when you started it. And we talk about new creature food, new creature cook, and that. Um, and moving it then toward this very question of what the, the good thing I found, which is something that Deleuze was talking about at the time, too, in, in, in the jubilation of Deleuze, um, whereas this is a much more quiet time. And then, you know, I don't know, at the end they were talking about how the feminism question is not one that often would be imposed. And I was curious whether, what your reaction to that was. Where, where Laura and Lauren and Deleuze 
not a reaction. <laughs> for but, me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think that indeed, uh, for, for Sarah Kaufman, you know, uh, that, that's the passage that, that I quoted, uh, I think the only, the only feminist uh, gesture I have made is just the fact that I try to construct mm -hmm. a philosophical work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and she always refused, you know, to, to uh, uh, be uh, an activist mm -hmm. in the classic sense of the term. So I, I think that if we take uh, feminism to mean some kind of political activism mm -hmm. uh, in the traditional sense of the term, Sarah Kaufman was, was not mm -hmm. feminist. And, and that's why the reception of her work in feminist studies and gender studies and certain kind of gender studies is it, still so hard to play. But, but from another point of view, of course, um, we can say that since her work was a philosophical one and since the only, gest the only feminist gesture she, she, she did, was to construct a, a philosophical work. Well, everything that she's done was was a feminist mm -hmm. way of doing that. Yeah. So um, it'll be useful for people to listen to brilliant this morning. I mean, I, and what I took from it was really the idea that um, uh, I mean, Jean Piaget talked about. Kind of Virginia Woolf as embodying a certain kind of uh, becoming an author uh, that is uh, was a kind of a, a, a resolution of uh, the woman question mm -hmm. is to, to be the author mm -hmm. and that and that uh, and that what Sarah Kaufman did was in a very similar way it was to become was to be a philosopher mm -hmm. and, and that was an invention. It is of course. Interesting, but and, and but this is something that Daniel uh, Boyd and Nas also emphasize. And it's interesting, of course, that uh, Sarah Kaufman took on so uh, directly and at the end of her life the Jewish question, uh, writing the book, the Week of the Chief, and for uh, that was her uh, last book, uh, actually. I think it came out before, so that would, that would have been her last book. Um, I didn't need to check. Oh, anyway, they're both 94, and she was writing them together. Mm -hmm. um, but that directly addresses the anti Semitism question, but really didn't do the same thing with the woman question mm -hmm. that it didn't do. And of course, as as the young Kwame Nas was suggesting, when she identified herself, she identified herself as moi.